What is there for young anthropologists to do? In one sense, everything. The best possible work has not yet been done. If I were 21 today, I would elect to join the communicating network of those young people the world over who recognize the urgency of life supporting change as an anthropologist. But even so, I speak out of experience of my own lifetime of seeing past and future as aspects of the present. Knowledge joined to action. Knowledge about what man has been and is can protect the future. There is hope, I believe, in seeing the human adventure as a whole and in the shared trust that knowledge about mankind, sought in reverence for life, can bring life. This program is brought to you by Emory University. We'd like to welcome Barbara Turnus to the CNBC. Barbara served as Margaret Mead's personal assistant in the mid-1970s, and you traveled with Dr. Mead to conferences, um, lecture tours, and sort of coordinated her schedule in some ways and worked with her at the American Museum of Natural History and at Columbia University. And then during the summer of 1977, when you were at the state of anthropologist, I'm telling your, your own life story here, Edmund Carpenter, Barbara invited Dr. Mead to stay with her during her final days. Barbara received her BA in Anthropology and Sociology from City College of New York and an MA in Applied Anthropology from Teachers College at Columbia University. And um, following your work with Dr. Mead, you, Barbara directed a community center in Greenwich Village, which we were just talking yeah. about, um, and was program officer at a foundation supporting grassroots community organizing in, in, in New York City. And then you retired re fairly recently, yeah, after 20 years as founding director of a community resource center in Vermont. And we are so excited to have you here and hear a bit about your personal reflections on working with Margaret Mead. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. For, I think what she might have done and what I think I need to do is to have, if you would all go around and just say a little bit where you're coming from, what you're, I won't remember your names. She might have. She has a very good memory. But um, just, I know Leslie, but if you just say, and then I'll get a sense of who I'm talking to and, and then be able to have a better sense. Yeah, um, I'm Lynn Nygaard. I'm the director of the CNBC and um, a faculty in the psychology department in cognition and development. And I'm interested in how we um, use spoken language and the different aspects of spoken language, from the linguistic structure to the properties of spoken language that let us know who's talking and how they're feeling. Philippe Rochard, uh, I'm a faculty here in psychology. I'm a developmental psychologist interested in early social cognition, but also from a cross-cultural perspective. So I've been traveling in the region close to where uh, Mead, you know, did her research. And um, so. Uh, my name is Danny Dilks. I'm also faculty in the psychology department. Um, I am a cognitive neuroscientist. So I look at the bits of the cortex that are responsible for our ability to recognize spaces, for example, mm -hmm. to recognize places and get around those places. Um, and the second question related to that is, uh, how do they develop? Where do they come from? So it is innate, is it experience, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Jimmy Daly. I'm a lab coordinator in the memory lab here at Emory. Um, and we're doing some work on memory integration, so how people put uh, facts together to uh, drive new mm -hmm. information. I'm uh, Dietrich Stout. I'm the associate director of CNBC and uh, faculty in anthropology. I'm a uh, Paleolithic archaeologist uh, with a special interest in the relationship between technology and the evolution of the human brain, uh, cognition, and language. Um, I'm Megan. Uh, we spoke a minute ago. Um, I'm a graduate student in the anthropology program working with uh, Dr. Stout. And uh, my interests are in. Um, Child development, social learning, language, and tool use, the intersection of these things. 
I'm Justin Poggio. I'm a postdoc in the Paleolithic Technology Lab with uh, Dietrich Staub. And I'm broadly interested in the role of technology in human evolution, and especially social and cultural processes around the learning of skills and technology. Mm -hmm. And I'm Priya. I'm basically from India, but uh, I, I live in Atlanta for the past 10 years. So here I'm working with Dr. Emery, and uh, I'm interested in neuro neuropsychology. Basically, I'm a psychologist from India, but uh, now I'm uh, working with Dr. Emery. So I'm doing um, some assessments and therapies kind of thing with the Dr. Emery. My name is Carla. I'm from Brazil, mm. and I'm here as a scholar um, doing research also in Dr. Emery's lab. Uh, my interest is in baby neurocognitive development. Mm -hmm. We know who, everyone knows who you are. <laughs> um, Tomorrow. <laughs> just, just a few things. I mean, she was very advanced in her, Mead was very advanced in her use of technology, which may seem primitive now. But when she and her then husband, Gregory Bateson, went to Bali, they took photographs. This was unheard of in the 1930s. They did films. So it's basic, but she was always on the, on the cusp of, of using different things. And a lot of it does have to do with language. And there's actually an interesting book that she wrote part of with um, a man named Paul Byers about small conferences. And she was interested in what people say, let's say, in a, in a, in a room like this or in a small conference. And she was always looking at semiotics and different things. So she, that was very early. This was the beginning of what you're doing now, which is not a long time. Um, so I was just, I'm going to, I don't want it to be all my voice. I'm going to read you things that other people wrote about her. I'll read you one thing she wrote. Um, I'll um, show you some photographs. And um, there's some books. And if you want, I'll leave handouts of what I'm reading from if you want them. But you must have a lot of paper, and we're not all about doing that. Um, I was 26 years old. I had graduated from CCNY. All of her assistants at that time were from Barnard. They were all Barnard girls, and I sort of <laughs> broke the mold. And um, one of the reasons she liked me is I was a New Yorker, and I knew how to hail a taxi. <laughs> so the others really didn't know how to do that. But so that, so that was nice. Um, it was fun for me, and she made a big thing out of that. I worked for her in an office in the American Museum of Natural History. The way I got to be close to her is she was a visiting scholar then at National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And a friend of mine had seen her at the American Psychological Association where her hem was hanging down. And so this friend of mine said, you should meet her at the airport. What's this little old lady going and getting into the airport and then leaving from the airport? Why don't you rent a car? So I suggested that. And Mead said, yes, rent a car, pick me up on Thursday night or Friday, whenever it was, and then take, and I would take her back Monday. So we had a lot of time in those early days in a car. So the moral of the story is if you want to get close to somebody, drive them back and forth <laughs> to the airport. And, um, and she was very open as a person. So you, we would talk about a lot of different things. I did travel with her sometimes, and mostly to conferences. I never traveled overseas with her, except we went to Mexico to a conference once. I was her scheduling secretary. My own, and it, like, to be personal, my own daughter is named Marie Margaret Turnus. Um, and she was born four days after Margaret Mead died. So these are photographs of the way she looked. This is, was her publicity photo, which I would send around. And this was just her in her office, maybe a few years before I worked, maybe 10 years before I worked for her. I'm going to read what she said about her office, because that was a big part of her life, and it's alluded to in other things I'll talk about. She wrote um, a piece that she proposed to go to the New York Times. I'm not sure if the New York Times ever, ever really published this, but she said, she's talking about herself as a young girl starting to live in New York as a college student at, Bar at Barnard. Um, New York became home, and after I became a member of the staff of the American Museum of Natural History, my office became the most permanent home I have ever had since then, where pictures and heirlooms could be left safely, and scientific manuscripts and love letters were equally safe. Um, so let's just, I, I kind of want you to see her, I don't kind of, I want you to see her as a person who had a love life, who had a social life, who had a 
intellectual life, vast numbers of friends, and and just very very human. I used to say when I would explain what it was like to work for her, she was more she was exponentially human. She could be more terrible and she could be more wonderful. She wasn't afraid to have a temper tantrum like a two year old, but she also was the most generous and the most giving in, in many different ways. Um, the office was a place. We had a lot of space in the American Museum of Natural History and in the museum it's very um, tight on space. So she would sing for her supper by giving lectures once in a while at the museum, which they would, they would publicize. We had, um, she hired, the way she managed her office was she did lecture tours to make money and she paid the assistants herself. And she had um, a bibliographer, a full-time bibliographer, just to manage all the things she was writing and publishing and doing. Um, Middle-aged women and all the others were these young, scared secretaries <laughs> whom she terrorized. Um, I was a scheduling secretary. There was a publications assistant or secretary. We called them secretaries then. There was a correspondence assistant who just took care of all the correspondence, full-time jobs. And there was a photo assistant who took care of the photos, and the photo requests. And then there were these two older women, Marie Eichelberger, for whom my daughter is named, and her assistant, Mrs. Gilbert. And Marie Eichelberger had been a friend of hers at Barnard, and she ran the institute. And she used to say, it takes seven of us to keep her in the air. And it did. We were just all working all the time, and she was producing and doing and traveling, and she was away much more than, than she was at the office. The institute, sure. was the institute was called the Institute for Intercultural Studies, and it was her own place. It wasn't. It wasn't at Columbia. It was just a. It was a nonprofit. Ruth Benedict's. Ruth Benedict's. Some of Ruth Benedict's royalties went into it. Some of. Mead, all of Mead's lecture tour money went into it. And through that money, she could pay these five assistants. It was its own, her own private foundation. And she funded it by traveling, which she loved doing, traveling all around the country and, and speaking at colleges. And that's how she met Austin Ford. And that's how I met Austin Ford. So she came to Emory as a visiting scholar in residence in the 60s. There's many versions of this story, but my version that I heard was that she said to someone, I want to find out what's going on in civil rights here in Atlanta. And someone said, you have to meet Austin Ford. So they became lifelong friends. And then when I, that was in the 60s. And in the 70s, when I was scheduling her to come to the South on lecture tours to colleges, she would say, I want Austin to meet me at the airport. I want him to drive me around because he can be quiet. <laughs> I think people talked a lot to her and wanted her to talk to them, and she sometimes just wanted it to be quiet. And she admired him, and they were great friends. Um, and, then, and then I developed a friendship with Austin through that way, and that's why I come to Atlanta. So another way we did things was everything was color-coded. I was green, she was yellow, this other woman was blue, someone else was white, someone else was pink. And this is the days of typewriters and paper and carbon copies. Mm -hmm. So we would, all of us, write long memos to her almost every day. And it would have, like, I, I, mine would be green with a carbon copy. And she would, I would say, I'm sending you 16, I mean, maybe 20 requests for things to do, 20 requests of people who want to see you. The publication secretary was sending her her 20. We had an interesting system, which I sort of, of red dots. So if you wanted to, how would, this is the way she thought, like how would you make something out of this list that all looks equal? You could put red dots on it. Two red dots was even more. Three red dots was even more. Sometimes she said it looked like measles on the page because there were so many red dots because we were all concerned that she would pay attention to what we were saying. We would leave these bags at her apartment, which was right across the street from the American Museum of Natural History. She would do whatever she did and we would pick them up in the morning with her annotations. So enormous. She also would get up at five in the morning to write while it was quiet. And then she'd have appointments, and then she'd take a nap in the afternoon. I knew her when she was seven. I started when she was 73. Um, my job was to create itineraries for her, whether they were international, going to the South Seas again, or Bali, or going across the street. She'd have little cards of what she was doing that day, 
and then it would be an itinerary for every trip she took, every conference she went to, and all that. We also saved everything. Every little slip of paper she wrote on, and that's all at the Library of Congress now, and there are boxes and boxes and boxes. And I think she learned some from Bird with, um, no, it was, she went to Buckminster Fuller's place once and saw how he organized his office. But she also had her own systems. We had systems for people, systems for organizations. We had a whereabouts file. So if you didn't know where something was, you were supposed to look in the whereabouts file, but that really <laughs> doesn't work very well. Um, yeah. And then because I was scheduling her appointments, I got to know her friends. One of them, Austin, but other friends as well. And also she was, I'll read a little bit about that. She just, she just made friends all the time. There's one of these um, obituaries that says she made two friends a month and she kept them and it was just voluminous and she had this huge network. Um, she was a celebrity and that's why you know her name. She isn't, she didn't fade away. I mean, I'm always surprised now when I meet younger people like you who still know her because I don't think everyone knows her anymore. But um, she was, she was very telegenic. She would go on TV a lot. Um, and so that was one way she spread her fame. But in the 1930s, when she wrote Coming of Age in Samoa, that launched her into the public eye. She had a, she also was very theatrical and in college and other places she was part of theatrics. She had a thumbstick, if you've seen pictures of her there, the picture of her there. She had this thumbstick that she would get from England. She had a red cape she would wear. Um, she was just, she knew how to dress. I don't know what a thumbstick is. Okay, so a thumbstick, so see, in the, where she's wearing the dot, it's a long, it's not a cane, it's a, it's a fork, it has a small fork on top. It's a special, a special kind it's of a wood. It's a walking stick or what? It was just her thing, Ceremonial. her staff. Her oh, oh, yeah, her. Oh, she did walk with it. You must. You must. Um, <laughs> right yeah, right exactly. right. <laughs> and just as an example of how she was, she she once said to me, when she was, there was one point where she was when she was living with us in East Hampton, and my stepdaughter was there, who was about eight years old at the time, and she let my stepdaughter walk her across the room. She, she could have walked, but she made a thing of being sort of weak, a sort of a play, and my stepdaughter. And then later on in the day, I said, thank you, that was so nice to involve Kate. She said, I can do Margaret Mead. <laughs> she could. She just very out there. So I'm going to read you something. She wrote for Red Book, a monthly column. So that was another way. But she wasn't, it wasn't about being famous for her. It was about communicating what she wanted to communicate to the widest audience she could. So Cy Chastler was the editor of Red Book magazine then, which was a woman's magazine. And he wrote, tributes like these to her life will make her sound formidable. She was not. She was accessible to everyone. She was as helpful, direct, and friendly speaking to the congregations of the smallest churches or synagogues in Iowa or Maine or Georgia or to villagers in Greece as she was unawed, forceful, and wise in the White House or in the halls of Congress where she was frequently called upon for advice and counsel. New York cab drivers knew and admired her. <laughs> Octogenarians and teenagers in the South Pacific honored and loved her and looked forward to her comings and goings. And then, then the other part, um, which is part of this, she says, on behalf of all of us, she worried constantly about the dangers of nuclear radiation, the piling up of nuclear weapons, the distribution of nuclear wastes, the pollution of our air and our earth, our water and our general disregard for the safety of humanity. She sought ways for women and men to learn to live together rationally and in comfort. She was worried that our communities did not care well enough for homeless children mm -hmm. and the handicapped and the aged. She spoke as she wrote directly with kindness, casting no blame, leaving no guilt. He knew her well. Of course. Do you know something about her parents? I mean, was it an academic uh, household? Uh, were they intellectuals? Uh, they were intellectuals. And, yeah. and they were kind of politically liberal? Or, I mean, do you know about what? what? I think, you know, I read 
her book is Blackberry Winter, and she talks about them a lot. I really can't answer you in enough detail. I know her father incurred, she felt her mother had the social part, the, the caring about the world, and her father taught, was interested in education. So she thinks, at one point she says she was an educator because of him. But, you, but so I, it, and teacher. I have, you were the teacher. I just, I don't know enough. I mean, I read it, and I was rereading it, but I can't, re, I can't really give you a thing. Um, the other thing she did, and I want to give you all a chance to ask me questions when we don't talk. I had been at meetings with her where she could get the gist of a meeting like that. I mean, I, you know, you're following, there's all these temp people talking, and this person says this and that. She had this amazing ability to synthesize and to um, pull it all together. A man named Lawrence Wiley became an anthropologist after he was a French literature scholar. And first she gave him a very hard time, and then she embraced him and became a very good friend. Um, and so I thought, I'm just going to read a few things that he said in, a, in, a, in an article called Margaret Mead is the Message. So he was reviewing books. After I came to Harvard, Mead frequently accepted invitations to speak to my classes. She did not like Harvard. And the honorarium I could offer was ridiculously small, but she welcomed a professional excuse to come to Cambridge and Boston to see her sister and her daughter, Kathy, and her family. Bateson reports in her book that her mother thought, and he says correctly, that Harvard was unfair to women. She would lecture on any suggested subject, of course, but she often veered away from it when she divined that the class needed a different message. The last time she came was in 1977, I believe, the lecture was on cultural differences in body symbolism, and as she got a feeling for the character of the course and of the students, she briefly put the subject in a perspective that illuminated the whole semester's work. No wonder the students told me later that they longed for someone like Margaret Mead at Harvard, but who could have been like Margaret Mead? <laughs> My husband, who knew her well, said that what she really was was a communicator, and I think you see that in, she used film, she used photographs, she used she used the TV, she used books. But she also really adored anthropology. <laughs> and I'm going to read you something that was written. This is from Blackberry Winter, which she wrote late in life in 73. What is there for young anthropology? This is her speaking now, not anybody about her. What is there for young anthropologists to do in one sense everything? The best possible work has not yet been done. If I were 21 today, I would elect to join the communicating network of those young people, the world over, who recognize the urgency of life supporting change as an anthropologist. But even so, I speak out of experience of my own lifetime of seeing past and future as aspects of the present. Knowledge joined to action. Knowledge about what man has been and is can protect the future. There is hope, I believe, in seeing the human adventure as a whole and in the shared trust that knowledge about mankind sought in reverence for life can bring life. You're not all environment. Maybe you all do have some sense of the environmentalist, but I think in other ways she was very advanced in that, really worrying about the planet. So this is something else she wrote. She wrote this in um, a book she wrote called World Enough in 1976. It was a book with photographs. She did a lot of collaboration with people, and she collaborated with a photographer named Ken Hyman, who said to me once, Mar Barbara, she's staying with you. She could have stayed anywhere. I said, <laughs> Ken, nobody else invited her, and she's staying with me. And then he came to visit her in East Hampton. But I remember, this is, this is her talking about in the book she did with him called World Enough. It is open to us to correct the damage that has been done when we gutted the resources of the earth, polluted its skies, distorted the lives of millions of its inhabitants. It is open to us to correct for the consequences of our limited purposes and partial understandings by widening the purposes until they coincide with the solar system in which we live. As we became human, when we could think of and talk of and take into account those whom we had never seen, we became more human because we can now think of the fates of all the peoples on this earth at once as part of one system. It is open to us to focus our purposes until they include each living being, those now alive 
and those who will be born in generations to come. The last thing is my husband's obituary of her. So my husband was the editor of Natural History magazine at the museum, and they were, they were friends before I knew him. I met him when he came to her office. Oh, I will find it. He was talking about the Peoples of the Pacific Hall, because his Natural History magazine was doing a supplement on the Peoples of the Pacific Hall, her hall, and that's where I met him. And so, and so he, she was very important to us as, um, as a couple, as a, you know. Um, when I stopped working for her, she, st she would come to my apartment for dinner. I actually inherited her apartment from a woman named Martha Wolfenstein, who had been a colleague from her, who she would... Her, she died, and her nephew wouldn't let anyone look at this rent-controlled rent apartment on Central Park West, but I got to see it, and we got this apartment. <laughs> and then I was crying to my husband about this apartment, which was a great apartment on Central Park West, because it was because Martha Wolfenstein had died, and I knew Margaret Mead would die very soon you know, after that. And he said, and I said, we can't afford it. <laughs> he said, it's okay, we can afford it. And we lived there for a long time and brought some of you know, and so it was a wonderful place. And she would come there to dinner with us. And she, um, so she was a big part of our lives. And then when this, the anthropologist Ted Carpenter, who was married to a woman named Adelaide de Manil, who's fabulously wealthy, and they had a huge estate in East Hampton. And Alan and my husband Alan and I were friendly with them. And I was going to be pregnant and staying there while I was collecting unemployment in this beautiful estate in East Hampton. And I said, I always called her Dr. Mead, would you like to come and stay with us? And she said, um, yes. <laughs> so she came, and she would come for four days a week, and then she would go into New York to see her healer. And it was a big scandal in those days. I mean, a lot of the people around her, the scientists or the anthropologists or the people in her family were, didn't want people to know that this scientist was seeing a healer. But she went to the healer. She would have tried anything. She just wanted to stay alive. Um, I got good at reading her handwriting, and when she was in the hospital, she scribbled this little note. And so you know when you're in the hospital, in those days they would give you pills and little, little cups, small cups. So the note said, tell them to put more substance in the offerings. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, she wanted to live, she, and she had cancer of the pancreas. And so these are some pictures of her in East Hampton. Um, it's still her, very her, but you can see. And they treated her like a queen. So we were in this lovely, lovely house, our own guest house, and then there was a main house, and when Ted Carpenter and Addie Demonell came back from being away in Bali, the main house would send food over, and it was like a procession of these these servants bringing her anything that would entice her to eat. And then there's a story about her eating. So the healer put her on a special diet. And I'll never, royal lunch crackers, and everything had to be organic, and this was 1977, and everything had to be pureed, and they would bring around sorrels puree and all this stuff. <laughs> but my husband, who was a lot like, who didn't follow conventions, he would get her, you would go to their supermarket, get these little malted milks in jars, <laughs> And he would always give her one, and she felt better in the morning every time. So we, you know, we didn't always follow the rules. The other thing was, I said to her, I was very pregnant, and I said to her, this, she, it was tense, obviously. It was, it was not an easy time. She was wonderful, and it was fun, and it was funny, but it's also this sick woman and worrying, and I was 30 years old, pregnant for the first time, and here she is. And so I said to her, this isn't good for the baby. And she said, if it gets bad, I'll leave. Mm. So we stuck it out. Um, we stuck it out till the end. She um, stayed with us. Actually, my husband was back at the museum, and I was just doing my unemployment thing, going into unemployment for a long time, as long as we could. And then in the end, she went to New York for one of these visits to the healer, and um, something must have triggered her going to the hospital. And then... Um, in the hospital, even even Margaret Mead, they can't keep you there unless they're doing something to you. And whatever they did, that was just sort of shortened shortened her lifespan. Um, and 
but she wasn't going to live very long. She had cancer of the pancreas, which in those days was quite incurable. Um, so my husband, as the editor of, Na of Natural History Magazine, had published some of her stuff and also published archaeologists and anthropologists and natural history stuff. And they were, um, she once said to me when she made me very unhappy, and you have Alan and he's interesting. <laughs> and I think, I think interesting was the operant word to be interesting. Um, so this is what he wrote. This is, and there's copy, I've made copies of these things that I've read from if you want them, but then I'll put them out later. So he wrote, um, his is, my favorite of it. In coming years, biographers will illuminate the many facets of Margaret Mead, scholar, scientist, cultural anthropologist, commentator, humanist, champion of the young and old, the oppressed and misunderstood, but the biographers might miss two facts that explain much of her phenomenal impact on so many people in the world. First, she was a deeply religious woman. Her sense of good and bad was astute and ever-present. She always strove to do good. Secondly, she had a touch of the poet, not in the sense of a precise polisher of words, but in the broader sense of finding the right image or metaphor that would have an awesome truth. She had an intuitive sense of timing. Her insight, sometimes based on only fragments of information, most often proved correct. So, so she was, you know, I'm glad you're interested in her. Let me end it at that. Oh, there's one more thing I just wanted to show you. There's this one more thing. We'll put it out in the middle. So when she turned 75, and I was working for her then, my husband created, it was his idea, but he got other people to do all the work, the Margaret Mead Film Festival as a birthday present to her when she was 75. And the Margaret Mead Film Festival was about anthropological films at first, but then it's now become this very big deal. And she was there at the first Margaret Mead Film Festival. And they took out, the, you know, Red Book and the museum took out a full page ad. So those are more pictures of her and what she looked like and what they said about her. But there's one thing that uh, <coughs> she was alive when uh, uh, this guy from Australia, Freeman. No, no, she was dead. Oh, she was dead. She was dead, and it was very impressive. So you know about that. Yeah. That was interesting. Uh, but, but she had some exchange with him before she passed. Didn't she? No. Okay. I mean, not not about what he was writing. He wrote after she died. They say that he, she died in seventy eight. Yeah. No, no, but this I don't know if you all know about. I don't. That. No. Do you want to explain that? <coughs> well, there's. Uh, I should ask an apology to that. There's this guy. What, what is that? Freeman? 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 Freeman. Freeman. Jarek Freeman, an Australian yeah, anthropologist. Australian uh, anthropologist who uh, had field work in in Samoa. Uh, and you know was a Matai, a chief there, and, and he, he he knows he knew the language and all that, and he did his own work and basically wrote a book that was pretty exposed in 1980, I think, where it came out, and mm. became enormously controversial. I mean, uh, and where he was putting into que into question uh, the the coming of age original mm. book. Her work. He, he tried to debunk her work yeah. and yeah. say it was false. Interviewing um, <coughs> some some people who, I mean, young at the time, young woman who, you know, just report her experience of being coming of age in, in Samoa, who we know particular adolescence crisis of, of yeah. conflict that became the model against political model against. Uh, the, the, you know the issue that was happening in in the United States with uh, the prime associated with coming of age that it was possible to come of age without uh, uh, all the crises that were. So it became. But there was, there are two uh, things. Uh, uh, there are two things important about that. I mean, she. I mean, she was not. She was an anthropologist. She's a member of the American Anthropology, but she wasn't a big chummy. But they came to her defense. I was so. Surprised impressed and surprised. They, she, a lot of anthropologists defended her. The best thing about that is, well, they, they, either, they, either they were not trying to take sides or they were saying what she did. The best answer to that is what Ted Carpenter said to Edmund Carpenter, who's really interesting too, if you want interesting. Um, he said, do they, do they criticize Columbus's maps? That's the point. 
she went out, she was the first woman, 20 something years old, going out to Samoa by herself, doing field work. I mean, I'm sure, she, you know, so I, I think he said, I think he said it all. Her what? Uh, I'm not sure. I know she had lovers. She had one child. She had three husbands. Well, that's a good question. I thought that would come up. So she had she was married three times. First to a minister, she thought she'd be a minister's wife. That was going to be her her world. And then they divorced, and then she married a man named Ray O'Fortune, and they did field work in in. New Guinea together, and that's where she met Gregory Bateson, and that's when then she married Gregory Bateson, who is in his own, he's the most famous of the husbands, and um, and he's famous in his own right as a, as a almost philosopher, anthropologist, talking about lots of very, about um, other world. So, and they divorced, but they had a child together. Her child, her, Kathy Bateson, Catherine Bateson, was married to a man, an Armenian man, and they were living in Iran, and they had a daughter, and that was right around the time of the Iranian Revolution, 1977, 78. She came and visited her mother, but she really couldn't leave. It wasn't easy to leave Iran and to be back and forth, and her mother wasn't going to go to Iran. So, I mean, and also in Margaret's life, there were a lot of other people around. So, and I remember being in the hospital when her daughter was there, when they said, and and Marie Eichelberger, who was this very important person, both in Kathy Bateson's life and in Margaret's life, my life, I named my child for her. She, Marie said, she, they said goodbye. So they had to say goodbye. And I was in the hospital one day and Kathy was there. And I don't know Kathy very well. She lives in New Hampshire now. She's an anthropologist, a linguist on her, in her own right. She, um, I could hear Margaret telling Kathy, it's all right. It's all right. You can go and, and it, under the you know somehow and you know and there were the, and there, there were lots of people visiting. There were she was yeah. surrounded by people. So Kathy had to go back, and it was much you know. And then it was hard. Yeah. And she adored her granddaughter, and she was also. I mean, we we alluded to this. She was very interested in children and a lot of the work. In fact, there's some monograph there on. There's a little book about Santa Claus, an interview with Santa Claus. There's a book about play, cross-cultural play. A lot of her interests were in, in children and raising children. I mean, like, was it Bathing Children in Four Cultures is one of the movies she she did. It was, all, it was a lot about children. She was a great pleasure, actually. I don't know. Yeah, I know that. But actually, one of my best childhood friends in, in Geneva is the... Godson of Margaret Mead, uh, <laughs> Michael Heller. I don't know if you know. Michael who? Heller. Heller. The name. Anyways, it, 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 and so he told me he was very close to to me and told me a lot of stories, of course. And they organized with uh, Catherine Bates and they organized a conference like not a few years ago, uh, which was the hundredth anniversary of uh, Margaret Mead's death or oh, her. Sorry. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, right. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah. But, that, but one, mean, one question that I have, I'm really curious to see if uh, Margaret Mead kept intellectual exchange with Gregory Bates and yeah. as time went on. Oh, yes. Forever. I mean, till she died. Okay. In fact, I answered the phone to tell him she died. And he had, at that point, he had can lung cancer, and he said, I'll be joining her soon. Mm -hmm. So, and they were colleagues. They worked together. Did she, um, did she have mentor students? Uh, was that a big part of her life? Yeah. yeah um, uh, through a particular university or through her... Um, Institute. Yes. Yeah, both. So my the person whose job who was my predecessor as scheduling secretary, she became an anthropologist and there's a recent book of things related to something Mead did and Nancy Lucky House is there and she she kept and there were a lot of students who became who who became who stayed close to her. 
She also had an interesting way when she, as a, I would schedule her appointments at Columbia as well, but at Columbia, she graded you against yourself. It wasn't against everybody else. It was about what you could do. And she also had photo, she, there was photographs of the student, of a student on a card. So if she met you, she would have a card with your photo and things about you. And she was interested, very interested in young people and students. And she did mentor. I mean, I think that's one of the, probably, that was one of her qualities, is to be a, a mentor for many, many people. I mean, this man, Lawrence Wiley, who wrote the Mead is the Message. She was his mentor. What was her relationship to Ruth Benedict? Uh, I mean, did they, was it, was there more than a, uh, advisee, advisor relationship? I don't know any more. I don't know personally, mm -hmm. but if you, you, you can read the things as well as I, the yeah. things that are written. And there's letters from the field where they're writing very loving letters to each other, and I think they were very close. But I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. When did Ruth Benedict die? I don't know. Ruth. I don't. I don't know. So just an example. So we went on a cruise, my husband and I, before we were married. Everything. I wasn't married when she was alive. So, so I, I married after. So we went on a cruise with her and a man named. And we went on this cruise, and it was a cruise where you get an eclipse, where you go out and see the eclipse. So they would stop the engines so all these people with their big cameras and could take pictures. So they did that as a test, and Jeffrey started acting really weird, really weird. So I was like, whoa. And she said he went into a fugal state. So there, she, I think he was having some psychological, he was seeing his dead brother walk into the cruise ship. And, and so, of course, my husband and I got stuck with this because she was getting off at the next port <laughs> to go somewhere else. <laughs> but, but, the, but the point, I mean, that was fun. I mean, we would be playing solitaire outside his room, just hoping he was OK. But she also wanted us all to write memos about it. Like just everything was to observe what went on. She wrote a long memo, noticing that he hadn't been the same when he ordered the wine. What did we notice? We should all write this up. Like always observing, always watching. When they te they started doing IQs in Barnard, I mean, she took an IQ test in the 30s in Barnard. This is the beginning of the psychological testing, which are, some of you are doing now. She was off the charts. The most amazing memory. And just, but also just smart. And, and also what is smart and what is an IQ test test, but just smart in a way, observing. And some of her field notes, which I didn't bring because I had a couple, it's like the way the mother's arm went over the, the baby, the way she took the arm of the baby and just the way, she was like, as a poet too, but just watching. And when she taught anthropology students, she was trying to show them how you have to observe everything. It was hard. So she wanted us to observe. Jeffrey's fugal state, which thank God he got out of in a while. So I said to my husband, I'm drinking my way through this. We're going to have sherry all the time. This is, this is going to be bad. But she's getting off at the next thing, which, was, which is also like her. I mean, we could handle it, and she wasn't going to be. <laughs> Where was the cruise that you were talking about that you went through? We went through the Panama Canal and um, went into these other, like into Mexico, and, and then you had to maneuver around, um, the, the captain had to maneuver around um, clouds to make sure it was, and they had, it was a solar eclipse. So these people, these amateur, um, what would they be, astronomers had their cameras and they had them all set up, and it was very incredible. We were lucky to go with her, it was fun. My friend told me that uh, <coughs> she, uh, she told him that uh, she felt very lonely at times, like in hotel, giving talks and stuff like that. Did you witness that? Did you know it doesn't that? sound right. Yeah. Doesn't. I just don't. Yeah. I, I never experienced her. I, I I never heard her say that. I don't know, but I'm, but there may have been times she was. I don't know that that. Um, yeah, it, it was she reminded was me. I don't know what <coughs> you know with fame and 
Lots of exposure with this, this kind of vacuum. Yeah. Well, this whole thing of picking her up at the airport. Here is this 73-year-old woman. But she was capable. Of, she didn't really need me. But she enjoyed people. And she made friends everywhere. And she kept her friends. Huge Christmas card list. And she, and she cared about people. And, she, and they'd have parties and parties in their home and her home. And I mean, she just really was... That's why I, there's one book there called Life is with People, and that's what I think about her. It, it's the title of a book about the shtetl that these um, the anthropologists wrote, like an oral history of people who'd been in, in, um, in Eastern Europe. And it's just all about life is with, with people. So she may have been lonely at times. Never showed it. She wasn't. So in East Hampton, so this is, this is a funny story. So I think, so, so in East Hampton, there was one time, for some reason, I couldn't be there with her. And so these, these two people who were still working for her, these two secretaries, came, and they were sleeping upstairs in the bedrooms, and she was downstairs in her grand room. And, and in the middle of I heard about this. I wasn't there. She rings a bell. And they run downstairs, and she says, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. She's funny. She, she had a great sense of humor. So I don't. She wasn't lonely then. She yeah. knew, and she knew how to call people. She, she, with, I mean, how many copies of *Coming of Age* has been sold? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. Okay, millions. What? Literally millions. Yeah. 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 So she, she's been rich. I mean, she was rich. I mean, no, she, she became wasn't rich. But she became rich. No, she wasn't rich. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, she just wasn't rich. She wasn't rich. And and like, so, so so she wasn't rich. I knew, I, I know where she lived, I, and she could buy it, but she didn't care about money. So once, so Marie Eichelberger, the administrator of this, her friend, would just hand her cash, and everywhere she went, she'd get a lot of cash. This is before credit cards were, so she, she had no concept of money, she just paid the taxi driver. So one day she realized she was underpaying all of us. So the next month, we got raises like a 50%. Because she realized that she didn't realize that we were being like paid peon. We, I mean, the, the other secretaries and I were just weren't being paid a living wage at all. So she just raised it. So I kept that yeah, little sheet. Anyway, so she was capable of the grand gesture and capable of doing things. But she didn't have any sense of money. And, she, I mean, she would go shopping in Florida sometimes because they had old lady clothes and there was a dressmaker who would do things for her. And she didn't need things or care about things. <laughs> so she was here at Emory for a visiting scholarship, she, and that's where she met Austin. Austin Ward. Okay. And probably then, yeah. And she maintained that friendship. And you, oh, or yes. you, yeah. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. And then, and it was pretty one. So they were friends, and then, and I became a friend through the telephone, and you know, I became his friend, and we became close. And then, when I was with her in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. He's the only one who called and said, Barbara, how are you? Hmm. And then I said to him once, are you her spiritual advisor? And he said, I'm everyone's spiritual advisor. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty interesting, too. Yeah. yeah Barbara, were, you were with her for how long? I worked for her for four years. And so you were grossly underpaid? Yeah. <laughs> Why did you stay? It was probably the most interesting Probably it was an incredible thing. Also, then I left. I left before she died. I knew I had to go do something else. I was in my late 20s, and I needed a different career. I wasn't going to be a secretary for the rest of my life. But it was pretty wonderful. Also, I got these two classes at college every semester, so that paid. they paid the tuition. I took a course. I knew already Ted Carpenter because I had taken courses with him in, in um, California. I met him when I was studying in a summer in UCLA and then I would take a course he taught at the, at the new school and uh, so and it was it was in, it was interesting it was never dull <laughs> um, so I stayed and then I left knowing I'd do something else and then um, and then then I got pregnant <laughs> I said sound like a and I was like an unwed mother yeah. so I was pregnant and I stopped working and um, and then so but a lot of people there, it'd be interesting. It would have been interesting. It's impossible to have a reunion of all the people who worked for her. Some of them so such interesting women, all women. Uh -huh. All women. When I was there, I, th I think always women. 
But then women were secretaries then. And what she needed was secretaries. She didn't, you know. She was French. She had men, male students, and there might have been. Uh -huh. so right. What was the ratio about of male, male female students, like graduate students? I don't know. I don't know. She taught undergraduate and graduate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she had a lot of doctoral students, right? I mean, all she had years. doctoral students, but she wouldn't have been an advisor on your thesis. I don't think she would have sat still long enough for that. I think she was always traveling. So I don't remember when I was there that she ever was like a thesis advisor. She would be, she would teach a graduate class, but she only taught one semester out of the two. Was the foundation after she was emeritus or something? Or was Institute for Intercultural foundation? Studies was started earlier, and, it, and Ruth Benedict had died, and it got, and some other people would give, donated it. And then she used that as a way to like, have money to pay her, her secretaries, or the people who she needed to work for. So, and there still is an Institute for Intercultural Studies, which provides money for field work for anthropology students. Yeah, and Kathy Bates and her daughter was managing that. So there still is, a, and there probably is residual money. Maybe some of her royalties went there too. I think I did once. That's an interesting. He's yeah, an interesting guy. Always margin, never got a faculty position anywhere in you know, Stata. Mm -hmm. And he's been hugely influential. I think, in yes, he's been hugely influential. Yeah. He really was thinking a lot about psychology and the mm -hmm. interface. And he was way, way ahead of his time in his way. This book on uh, Bali, uh, the photograph, and, you know, and breastfeeding is mm -hmm. just like great. I think there's a copy of the, <coughs> the library. I mean, if you don't know it, you should be able to look at it. It's just mm -hmm. magnificent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was her background? How did she get into this? She was from Pennsylvania, right? She went to... She went to DePaul University at first and then, then transferred, to, then got her father to agree to send her to Barnard. Uh -huh. So then she went to Barnard. And then she was very influenced by Franz Boas, uh -huh. who was the anthropologist. <coughs> and, Got and so he, then she became an anthropologist and found her calling. I think she might have, you know, I'm not sure what she was majoring in at Barnard. She was, yeah. But Boas was, was at Columbia? Yes. Yeah. And also at the museum, I think. Mm -hmm. But he was her he was her mentor, and, and Ruth Benedict's. And he was the, the 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 advisor of Ruth Benedict. Yes, both of them. Yeah. Franz. So in the letters, you see them referring to Papa Franz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was another interesting. Man. He was very interesting. Yeah, very smart, and that has a lot to do with race too, because he was looking. He was pretty advanced about race relations. And some of anthropology are going to the third world, and it had to do with breaking down, thinking that, I mean, people thought that races were inferior. And he was, he, what he was doing and what they were, was debunking that. So what, what is different when I <coughs> talk with Tudor about mood and her work, and, and all this, and that, uh, it's, it's always quite difficult to dissociate the political agenda and you know the conviction from you know the, the actual scientific uh, observation I, I found. So we discuss it's a great topic but because pretty I mean if you read coming of age or uh, there's clearly there was some you know political visions and there was a message a clear message that you know yeah, there was a message there's a message about the world and and accepting everyone yeah. basically it's a religious message yeah. we are all equal at God's table. So when you said that you were religious I found that interesting. She was Episcopal, and she was religious. She was religious. But, but in terms of politics, something I forgot to bring up was that she campaigned for Jimmy Carter, the only person she ever campaigned for, your Georgia guy. So she campaigned for him. Because, partly, I think she, he was also religious, but also I think she felt it was time for this country to have a Southerner, and she saw it in this bigger perspective. And then when she was in the hospital dying, he called her and tried to reach her. And she said, just tell him, it's, he's too busy, he shouldn't be there. Huh. To her. But it's like, he, he, she doesn't have to bother. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think many people would do that <laughs> if the president were calling them. <laughs> you know, at the, uh, at the outset, you said something about uh, um, it's nice that younger people still know about 
smarter than me. But I would say, actually, if you were to approach somebody, say, on the street, and say, name an anthropologist, if they're able to name anybody at all, it would be Margaret Mead, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like the idea of a famous anthropologist is almost like an oxymoron now. <laughs> and certainly the idea that an anthropologist would be wanted by a presidential campaign to speak on their behalf. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, what, is it just that she was such a, uh, a magnetic uh, personality? Was it about... Her, or is there something about what she was doing that was more in tune with the times? Than I think Anthony? she was a magnetic personality. Yeah. She's one of these people, and there's some of these that say, like, you were in, you were in the presence of greatness. She was great. I mean, what does it mean? She was great. She was amazing. She was great. <laughs> and, and it was her personality. And, and also what Sy Chastler said, like, so open, mm -hmm. really wanting to engage you, wanting, wanting to meet you, wanting to talk to you, wanting to learn about you and also and so smart so damn smart so I think and I and also she used the television or the television used her so that helped I see and I was going to say the opposite I was going to say if I walked up to someone in the street and said who is the most famous anthropologist they would never have heard I think my perception and maybe my own that they wouldn't have ever heard of Margaret Mead and I think some young people never have if they haven't heard of her they haven't heard of anybody that's yeah. all <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you would be surprised, let's say, with this generation of undergraduate students, mm -hmm. they tend to know. In my seminars, they, we tend to, oh. half of them tend to know. She's covered in, you know, mm -hmm. all intro classes, and mm -hmm. even in psychology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was groundbreaking. Yeah. And, and she also wrote a lot. Do you want to, there's, her, her bibliography is a book. Boston used to say, we were lucky to know her. Mm -hmm. yeah, we were. And we feel that way about him. Can and we feel that way about him. For the record, just say who he is. I don't know that. Well, Austin Ford was a minister in Atlanta who just died a few weeks ago. He was a good friend of hers. But he, uh, a white Episcopal minister, had was the first rector of St. Bartholomew's. And then he convinced the Episcopal Church to purchase a dilapidated building in a poor black neighborhood, people's town, and he moved in. And he created a settlement house called Emmaus House, and he fought alongside civil rights leaders. He was one of them in Atlanta. He helped integrate the, the schools. Alan and I once were in Cumberland Island, and we were sitting next to someone, and he had arranged for us to be there, and we told her that he had, that we were friends, but she moved away because he had integrated the schools, and then she had had to send her daughter to private school. <laughs> he had a huge impact in Atlanta and on and in, and in, in bigger worlds too. So he he was a civil rights leader, an amazing champion of the poor and the disenfranchised, and and stayed living in this poor black neighborhood at the settlement house until he was too blind to drive the school bus where he took monthly trips to Reedsville prison so people could see their loved ones. So, yeah. so, and so. so he, he was in the theology department. Where, which department? He was affiliated to Emory? Yeah. I mean, he undergrad, was, 50. The what? He graduated from Emory in 50 and is undergraduate. Okay. Yeah. He went to Emory. He got the Emory Medal. <laughs> <laughs> But went to Suwannee for um, his theology seminary, yeah. or seminary. And when he was in Suwannee, they wouldn't let a black student into the seminary school. This and and that really galvanized his own sense of, of right and and what to do. And then he and then he and when and so my husband and I would come every Christmas with our children, and Christmas Eve was very integrated. He was all about and he was promoting integration in the South, in Atlanta, and other places. He believed strongly. So they had a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. So they did things. Is there a Wikipedia page on him? Yes, I mean, there is. And if you look him up, there's articles about him, okay. too. And you can find out about him. He was African-American? He was white. <laughs> so he died. And so you, when you, that's not funny. So <laughs> he died, and when you die, and there's a will, they have to send it to your cousins so they can protest. We can't find his cousins because they weren't talking to him. So that's interesting. So he really, he, like her, 
he was so steadfast, like he did what he knew was right. He knew it was right, and cousins, other people, even so. So he's he. I, I, we're lucky. We we're lucky to have known him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Leslie was very involved in his life. A neighbor of his, who shopped for him every month for a long time and amused him when come over and talk politics. This is, I'm sorry, I forgot what you what you do, you do what is your mm -hmm. here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I help tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> But um, through this friendship and uh, Barbara and when I came and <laughs> thought, hey, anthropology, <laughs> want to hear about Margaret Mead? Because I know that they were all very close friends and um, that Barbara had worked for him. So. Are there, um, can you just, oh, go ahead. Do you, everybody introduce yourself. Just do you want to, you came in a little bit late. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Monica Blasio. Oh, nice to meet you. Thank you. Was it, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, we're um, a little bit over time. This was um, really, really interesting. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this and coming to talk to us. And um, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, have, I, don't know you I, mean, I learned not to give out paper when you're speaking because then people look at the paper. So um, <laughs> oh, these, are, yes. these are copies yeah. of the things I read from. So if you want any of them, oh, feel no. free. And I also brought books over there just from my collection that seemed more interesting than mine. Thank you and very much. Barbara, thank you. Good meeting you. Yeah. 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 That, that was really a